Hi, Mr. Letelier. Thank you for coming here to SLU. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Logan, and I'm a sophomore here at SLU. And yeah, so I guess, how is it being up here in the, in the North Country? Oh, I just love it. I just love it. I just drove in from Potsdam, and you know, it's daytime when I came in before. It was like end of day, and I was really tired after a red eye. But just really beautiful to see precisely right now how we're moving into spring. Yeah, it's definitely a lot warmer than it's been. Um, so, I guess first uh, we can talk about the mural that you're creating in Potsdam with help from the community. So, according to um, a Nation article, I guess first we'll talk a little more about murals in general that you've done. So, according to a Nation article, the Orlando Letelier Mural Brigade was founded after your father passed away, and you're still creating murals all across the world, like Venice, U.S., um, Italy. Um, oh, that's it. <laughs> so, I might be missing some, but I see them diversely tied to themes of housing, um, poverty, violence in the environment. So where would you say your murals have made the greatest impacts? Wow. Uh, you know, well, the impact of a mural is always hard to judge. Uh, but I do create projects in order to create sites of cultural memory. And there's two things that happen there. One is in the collaborative and participatory murals that I create, we create a community of people, and often uh, you can't really tell the impact of a mural in the beginning because you've kind of activated or acted as a catalyst for someone who uh, may have a eureka moment in which they are working in something participatory and they've never had a participatory experience of creatively imagining something. So that's a huge thing for people, and it's a life-changing experience. So often, you can't really tell what inspired or excited this person. So I can't say that, you know, I never measure things like that. I'm always excited about what I'm doing now and what I'm doing next. Wow. Uh, so I guess in the mural experience that I like, first saw and looked into uh, by you is the one that's in the ODY um, library currently on campus. Right. So that one, there was one that was painted and donated by you. The other was created by the brigade with help from students here. And so the student did a lot of coordinating for this effort. Um, she said there's a common thread between the North Country and those struggling in um, Central America. And you said that public art needs to be community art in order to like make a greater difference. And so um, I guess with that, uh, I was wondering what is the current mural you're working on in Potsdam? What themes does it incorporate? And how does it seek to connect communities? Great, great question. Um, it's called the Building Bridges Mural. And it really has a lot to do with the Aviera exhibit that's been created, and it's the Arvieta exhibit that we're sitting in right now. In the gallery is a remarkable kind of uh, rescue of memory. These Arvieras wouldn't be here if it weren't for people from the you know North County and from around here who collected them and helped the Arvieristas, the women mostly who made these Arvieras in Chile during the dictatorship. So it's a very clear moment in which we see that the things that uh, the cultural expressions during the dictatorship in Chile were strengthened and helped by the actions of people up here in, you know, in New York State, in, in the United States. And often um, it's hard to see how, well, how can we have an impact on things happening way across the globe or in other places. But in this place, it, it's very clear that arvieras are not a traditional art form in Chile. They are an art form that was imagined and created in Chile during the dictatorship. Historically, 
that's a very brief period, 40 years ago. So it's still a new art form, and that art form during the dictatorship helped families survive, gave people a way to express their feelings, and became a way of uh, peacefully using culture to counter the effects of the dictatorship. And their, their lasting significance is clear now. So these wonderful, colorful tapestries now acquire more meaning, you know, with this patina of 40, 40 years. And um, the mural that I'm creating right now at State University, uh, New York Potsdam, is um, connected to the fact that, yes, we were here at St. Lawrence University um, 30 years ago now, creating these murals. At that point, Chileans were engaged in solidarity work. And the idea of solidarity is one that has to be understood as an exchange, an exchange of experience and information. Often people think solidarity has to do oh, look at those people over there, let's help them. But in the act of solidarity, you really help yourself or influence what's happening at home. Um, so what is the process of creating a mural? Uh, how much of this process is like painting versus planning? And then how do you combine? Yeah, I guess let's start with that. Like, What's the process behind it? Yeah. Well, you know, every single mural project is different, entirely different. I, I create murals that are contextual to place and situation. So all my murals, I don't know if you notice, if you saw some of them, they look different. Now, I've been making murals for several decades now, so of course they're going to look different. But the approach is always different because I'm collaborating with people. So, for example, the mural we're painting now, we're being very ambitious, because every, every time I create a mural, I want to do something great, surprise people in that, wow, look what artists working with untrained artists but coming together to create a work of art. Look at what, they, look at what people can do when they, when they try to do that. And so, but also, we're working within a very constrained time period. Now, um, I often have to remind people that the hard part of painting a mural is not the painting itself. People think that the creation of a mural, it's all about painting it, but that's just one important aspect of it. But the really important thing is what the mural is about and the kind of community and, uh, that you're creating, the kinds of ideas that you're processing with whomever you're working with. And that's the work team. And in the work team, maybe some of those people aren't painting. Maybe they're just doing research or, or, or reflecting some of the ideas that people are researching and, and helping us keep track of things logistically. But for, um, I often say to people, you know that expression, a picture speaks a thousand words. Well, a picture speaks a thousand words, but when you give it a title, and you tell me who did it, and then you tell me what that person was feeling, and you give me broader context, then it speaks a million words. So, although art speaks just in and of itself, public art, things we do collectively, always are like icebergs, or something that, you know, much of it is hidden below the surface. And so it's important during the painting of a mural to collect all those ideas because it's valuable, valuable information. It's just like building something, you know, you chop a lot of wood and then maybe you use part of that wood, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the lumber is no good. It can be used for further projects or to, you know, catalyze or strengthen other discussions from the mural. So I guess, since we are in the RPR collection currently, um, and you said that RPRs are a newer art form um, that came about during the Pinochet dictatorship. Um, so your mother, Isabel, often imported RPRs into the United States. So like, how did this influence or if it influenced um, 
like how you looked at art? Oh, I, it's influenced me enormously. One of the things that my mother was involved in with the Epietas is that she really wanted to create a timeline of events and experiences during the dictatorship. So I really saw that the Arpilleras, just like murals, were like a people's newspaper. And that, uh, you know, I haven't, I've just arrived, so I haven't been able to see this exhibit and how it's been curated. But often, um, for me, it, it's wonderful to see how an art form grows and chronicles a historical chapter in people's lives. And that is what I try to do with my work, in that we need to create sites of memory and create symbols that, that kind of make real our experiences and what we have to say about those experiences. So Arpilleras, you know, kind of the whole um, environment within which I was forming into personhood itself, and also an artist, I took it for granted that creative expression reflected our daily lives, our experiences, our highs and lows, and so that's really present in my art today. So, I'm an environmental studies major, and so when I was looking at murals you've done, I couldn't locate a photo of it, but I read about it. And it was a particular mural in Venice. It was called, um, let's see, it was called, I think it, it was in Ambrosia. And huh. on it had native species and animals of the Santa Monica Mountains. And so I was wondering, like, what your opinion was of, like, humans living among nature and the environment, and how else you, like, focused on the environment, like, sustainability, or just, like, humans' relationship with nature and what you think about. That. I'm so glad you brought up that subject because often, well, you know, nowadays, the idea of being socially conscious and, and responding to people's needs is so linked with, hey, the environment we live in, the world, climate change, it's affecting everybody. In the past, people were more kind of, I'm an environmentalist, I'm a human rights person. So, you know, people who love trees were out with the trees and defending old growth, for example, and that kind of thing. And other people were defending social processes in the city. But now, most people understand that these things cannot be separated. They're, they're entirely linked. And um, one thing I always tell people is that Chileans and others who have undergone uh, traumatic, violent moments of state violence and um, the experiences of living under a dictatorship, we're not defined by that. We're, we we uh, are loving, celebratory people, even in times of war. And it's important to remember the why it is that the dictatorship felt so threatened by the music of Victor Jara. Why they had to ban so much literature, so much creativity. They were frightened by these beautiful jewels that really were pointing humanity, Chile, and people towards uh, more freedoms, more, more opportunities to unveil what human beings truly can be. And of course, human beings, we are disconnected, you know, what we call nature deficit syndrome um, is something that uh, we have to address in order to heal, to create a better world. And often, uh, in, that, in that mural ambrosia, it's created in a place that's right next to a major, uh, street with a lot of traffic and many, many, you know, right behind the supermarket. Mm -hmm. And they're very small apartments, some of the smallest courtyard apartments in Venice in which working class Latino families live. And often, even though 
many people don't know that Los Angeles is surrounded by a huge part of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. It's actually one of the biggest wilderness areas surrounding a big metropolis in the United States. Most people don't know that. And certainly, you realize that when you go up to the mountains and do programs in the mountains with inner city kids, many inner city kids, even though the mountains are right there, they've never been up into the mountains. And my feeling for Ambrosia was, wow, they live surrounded by all this urbanity. Let me bring the Santa, Mon Santa Monica Mountains down to them. So it was kind of twofold of, let's, let's paint native species, let's be clear about this memory of these species that are here. All, all these things are threatened now with lack of water, with drought, with climate change there. But it was also sort of a gift to the people there to, you know, to give them at least a representation of nature in a place that was very, very urban. And um, interestingly, many years later, in a mural I painted in Chile at a, at a clinic, um, we use that same thing. People at a clinic are arriving for medical emergencies. They, they, you know, they're having troubles. And so we wanted to paint a mural in a neighborhood called El Bosque, the forest, in a place where all the forest has been cut down, super urban area in, you know, on the, on the fringes of Santiago in a working class district. And we use the same idea, let's, let's, do this environmental mural that kind of identifies the native forests that we are losing now for a variety of reasons, but also give people a place where they can feel, ah, uh, you know, here's just some beauty. During the painting of some of these murals, some people come up to me and they say, wow, you know, it's a shame that you're not painting a political mural. Because they imagine that a political mural always has to have a raised fist or something in it. But truly, and especially today, to create murals that are about the environment is a hugely political act. So I guess going back to now going back to the inner in the urban area, um, another particular mural that um, it, it had a portrait of a young African American male who was involved with gang violence, and this was in Los Angeles. And there was some community, like, I, I got the impression there was some community backlash, and that some people thought that it was possibly portraying like violence, or it, it wasn't, they weren't like receiving the message the way you intended it to be received. Right. Um, and so how do you like distinguish being between a victim and a victimizer? And like thinking about the Chilean military, like many people like on both sides of the conflict, like during the Pinochet dictatorship, might not have might not have been like they had a, a, a very good um, say or they had little option in their actions. Um, and I guess would you say that anyone could be a victim of violence, like even if they're the ones. Um, carrying it out. Uh, it, I'm not really understanding okay. your question, so I could talk to you about some of the impressions I got during it. But but it, it's really important to to understand that that there's many great areas yeah. in human experience, and I'm particularly interested in creating dialogues with people. I don't want to live in a world divided. I don't want to live in a world of, you know, where people are enemies. We're seeing that today in the United States. It's really important to find common ground with people. So our mural in Potsdam now is about building bridges of understanding. We all have many similar goals and desires. And because of the way we're put together, we, you know, we have different things. Often we have to dispel myths, so one of the myths that had to be dispelled during the painting of Becoming the Circle, that mural that you mentioned early on, is that um, the, the people that took objection for me to represent a young African-American male from the neighborhood, um, they didn't know that 60 boys 
from the neighborhood had been killed that summer through drive-by and gang violence and hadn't quite sat there to think because a gang member is a good example of someone who's a victim and a victimizer in certain cases. You know, if you grow up in certain neighborhoods, if you don't join the gang, you will be, you know, you, you're compelled and forced to become part of a group in your neighborhood, on your block, in your district. You, you have to contend with that. If you don't contend with that, you will have violence done to you or certain things happen. So many people have to navigate those cultural processes in different ways. But the people that were objecting to that didn't understand that these young men that had been killed were brothers, sons, grandchildren, nephews, and that every death represented many families and many people who had felt the impact of losing someone. And, and you know, we, we, those things were brought up, and address, and in the end, you know, after the mural was painted with a new lens and filter to look at it, she saw that it was something that, you know, people who, you know, we were in no way uh, celebrating gang violence or what we were saying is these are human beings that have been caught up in a crossfire of history, and and they're it's a they're tragic victims, and so it's kind of a way of respecting and honoring their families and their lives as well. So what is a, um, just thinking about bringing this to more, like if someone at SLU was watching this or any other university, someone plus um, what is a university student's role in activism, making a positive difference, and fighting for social justice? And are university students potentially in a place where they have like equal, less, or more ability to do so, like given like their specific privileges they have being able to be at university. Yeah. Well, you know, it's pretty hard to give, you know, kind of a yeah, across the board yeah. idea, and I can only speak from my personal experience, you know, my own personal experience and having witnessed things. But it's pretty clear that nowadays, that, that, for example, in Chile, mm -hmm. um, students are a huge force. Yeah. I, the, the whole uh, struggle in the past decade to uh, address the fact that education had been privatized and that people that did not have uh, as much money and resources as others were not going to receive the education they deserved as citizens of the country. And so it was students, it was high school and university students that created certain changes. They kind of stopped the country. And that's happening all the time. And also, United States history is replete with young people, you know, from, you know, more recently, the Vietnam War era, in the past, young people have been huge, you know, movers and catalysts of, of social movements that created profound changes in a country. And right now, of course, we have the examples of students from places where mass, mass shootings have occurred, as well as the current uh, uh, movement by uh, leaders that are high school age that are leading uh, um, movements to address climate change. And so what I can say to, to people at university level is, it's possible. It happens all the time. How do you do that? Well, pick your, pick your way of getting in there. The minute that we have empathy for others and understand that, you know, there by the grace of whatever you want to call it, go I, you know, often at university level, Maybe students have a hard time realizing that the most important people that they're going to meet are sitting right next to them in a classroom, right? They're sitting right next to them. And that every act they, they create today will resonate and echo into the future. But it always remains true. It's kind of a fact. 
and me being back here, you know, the murals that we painted here at St. Lawrence 30 years ago, I was in graduate school, just finishing graduate school, so I was still kind of university level, maybe finishing, with, but, but still, um, here I am back 30 years later in my lecture, I think in a little while I feel that I'm gonna be saying, okay, let me tell you what I've been doing, you know, but, but that, that all these small pushes and looking for a place really create a way to, to find a way into the world in which you can become uh, less of a spectator and more of a protagonist. Final question here uh, was that I thought reading the interview, um, it you were talking at the end uh, about jail and incarceration, and so as you're, you may be aware, probably aware, um, like St. Lawrence County, like up here in the North Country, there's a very large like prison population, and you mentioned that while jails are like necessary for just society, um, it's also um, very, very important to be creating historical facts, um, having information available for, for um, following generations, and creating mechanisms that allow people to have more healing. And so, um, the ways to move forward in conflict are hard, but what motivates you to keep hope in the healing process, and like, how do you think that your art aids in that goal? Mm. Well, you know, um, one, of the, one of the most impactful experiences I had as a young person living in Chile when my father was incarcerated was when we were finally allowed to go visit him when he was being held in a concentration camp. So it was a huge moment for me to see that my father was behind bars and barbed wire and guard towers and soldiers guarding someone who I knew to be peaceful and nonviolent and who had not committed crimes. But during the dictatorship, I saw many instances of people being imprisoned uh, for, for no crimes at all. And it made me really kind of have empathy years later when I started working with incarcerated youth. We were talking a little bit earlier about young people who uh, end up in gang situations and other situations. When you look at prisons and see that 80% of the population are low income and black and Latino in California, and that the majority, of them, then you see, well, wow, you know, it's very clear that that often. Uh, people end up in jail because they haven't had the minimum, minimum requirements for people to be able to have a life that allows them to live in a non-incarcerated way. And also, of course, prisons that are built for profit mixed with a, a, a judicial system that, that doesn't have the ability to take a bigger view of what's going on, then you know you have this this terrible confluence of, uh, of things. So the thing that allows me to be hopeful and to see that art can be healing is my experience of over 20 years of working with people who had been accused of violent crimes, young persons who you know for X, Y, or Z reasons had ended up jail and seeing how art, art is an entryway into being more of a human. It's not that art is great, it's just that, you know, that art is the ticket. Art, creativity and imagination is the way that all of us can enter a new place. So we have to create situations where we allow people to use their imaginations and creativity and give people permission to do that. 